Today we're joined by Felix, the entrepreneur behind Clarify, which helps buildings virus-proof themselves and measure indoor air quality. Felix, you're in Amsterdam currently. So tell us what it's like to start a company in Europe and a bit about your background. Thank you, Zane, for introducing me. Um, I think that there is quite a difference in starting a company in Europe in comparison to the US um, because the market is in general much more fragmented with just tiny countries, lots of borders, different cultures and different languages. So I think there is inherently a difference uh, around starting a company in Europe. Um, more specifically about starting in Amsterdam is actually really cool because Amsterdam is one of the hotspots when it comes to the startup ecosystem in Europe. And uh, the Dutch market is also quite advanced in the field of prop tech technology. So um, it's really exciting just to be here. And well, uh, we've seen uh, quite a, a change happening around prop tech and the use of offices in general with uh, regards to COVID-19, as you <laughs> can probably imagine. So it's, um, it's, it's, it's very interesting. It's a really interesting time right now. You know, one thing I, 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 I learned myself, I started my last company in London. And when I came out to the US, a lot of the investors in the US um, were pressuring me just to stay focused on what they call the US domestic market. And it's easy to do that when you live in a country so large as a continent and you know, a market that's quite big. But I tend to find that the European um, startups themselves are forced to go international very, very quickly. First, I'd say, you know, pan Europe, and then after that, global very, very quickly. I mean, we were an example, you know, we started in London, then I, I had an office in, in Berlin and also in, in San Francisco. Eventually, we had eight, nine offices, more aggressive than any other startup in our industry because we, we had that international DNA. Um, when you talk about the fact that there's a lot of fragmentation, specifically for prop tech. How do you as an entrepreneur think about where to focus as your market? Do you, and what did you do? Did you focus just on Amsterdam solely? Um, or did you start to go to neighboring countries or did you go wherever the hell you could and wherever your clients are willing to pay you? Well, the scope for us is actually really international as well. I think we share a lot of similarities in that view. Um, we started off just in Amsterdam, touching the local market and doing uh, good research around the whole ecosystem that's present. Um, but we're actually uh, looking on a, uh, on, a, on a larger picture also at other tech hubs primarily, or let's say um, places in Europe where um, tenants value a lot of the uh, intrinsic value that people bring along. So let's say you have London for, for example, finance and fintech, but you have Dublin as well for the large headquarters of most big tech companies. So the people that go towards these places, they are obviously very valuable assets to these kinds of companies. Therefore, there's a lot more interest in to invest in a healthy environment in comparison to perhaps other places. So the scope for us to go international is um, yeah, quite progressive. At this point, we've been to international conferences already. We've been selected in 2019 prior to COVID for the Web Summit in Lisbon, which was a thrilling experience. And we've participated last fall in the um, plug and play accelerator program from uh, Silicon Valley. And that was, that was really interesting also uh, to talk with a lot of these companies and investors and um, uh, partners of their ecosystem who are located in the APAC region. It really uh, broadens our mind on focusing internationally, uh, uh, yeah, quite rapid. Yeah, I, um, I think you touched on an important point there, which is uh, the availability of talent as well. Um, after, after running my last startup in San Francisco, I swore to myself, never again will I hire engineers in um, Silicon Valley. It's just so expensive and the level of entitlement was crazy. You know, when you have Google and Facebook offering crazy signing bonuses, when your average engineer in the interview says, what's your policy for pets? Will you, will you pick and drop me off? Will you take my dog to the doggy daycare and will you, will you iron my clothes? You're thinking, hold on, shouldn't you be asking me about the product? Shouldn't you be asking me about, you know, the tech stack? Um, and so we got to a situation where there was quite a bubble and I do fear another bubble will form 
as people leave California to places like Texas. Um, what is the uh, labor like in um, Europe? Because when I was in London, people were very grateful uh, but, you know, to, to, to work for a startup. Um, people didn't even expect equity, actually. You know, in, in, in America, I felt that uh, a lot of people are very clued up and uh, would demand equity. And, you know, universities actually teach their students how to negotiate with, with startups. Uh, in Europe, very different. In fact, in Europe, I was pleasantly surprised w when we were at a larger stage. Um, some of the employees didn't care about equity at all. They wanted that safety and stability. What are you seeing um, when it comes to um, sort of the affordability of talent, the hotspots in Europe where talent is and their expectations? Do you think people want salary? Do they want equity? Do they want bonuses? Are things changing? Well, things are changing in a bit. I mean, uh, there there is um, there is a lot of interest from uh, younger people, recent graduates to join startups, but also more uh, the senior ones. In general, what I tend to see is that um, also from my group of friends, uh, of whom uh, some have their own companies and uh, some work at startups, um, it's very normal to give away equity, especially in tech startups. Uh, so they get a, an option uh, with uh, they get options with their contracts, um, and it it kind of uh, drops also the the, the the base salary a bit, uh, which is especially in Amsterdam I think quite a thing because the cost of living here are quite high. Uh, rent has been increasing over the last years tremendously uh, because of a higher influx of international students and a lot of experts since the Brexit. So there's quite some change happening in that in that market as well. So salary is quite an important thing, but I think um, because we also have quite a social uh, system in place in comparison to the US that uh, the demand for sky high salaries is not uh, that much from a necessity point of view, which I can imagine is different when you're living in San Francisco because it's one of the most expensive places in the US, if I'm correct. So uh, from a salary point of view, I think there's, uh, there's quite some room uh, for negotiations. And it really, um, uh, what, what I really experienced from um, my uh, uh, environment is that it's also largely about the journey. And I think that's the best way to attract talent uh, to either your own company or one of the reasons why you should join a startup or a scale-up in general. Um, if you don't have any affinity with the journey, I think you're just in the wrong place. <laughs> yeah, and I, I think it's easier than ever to start a company now. There's accelerators everywhere. There's a culture now. When I used to tell people I'm doing a startup, people would pretty much say, so what, you're unemployed, basically. And I graduated, for the older listeners amongst us, during the uh, credit crunch, um, you know, the, the recession or whatever you want to call it, the financial crisis. Um, and so there was this whole, you know, you could say generation of people who went to top two universities, expected to get you know, multiple offers from Goldman Sachs and all the banking consulting areas. And suddenly all these people are forced to like change their expectations. And many people I knew who were very intelligent weren't able to get a job. We just graduated at the wrong time. Uh, and, and there I was looking at a startup and, and people would often be like j joking around. Now, I think people have learned, okay, wait, a startup isn't this like just doing nothing and, you know, f just poning around this is a hot thing. People want to do a startup. Um, you know, people in established careers want to do a startup and people want to do a startup as soon as they leave university and some during university. It's becoming a, a very common part of the culture. And I'm glad to see that because the economy needs more small businesses and also more scale-ups because this is what's going to take our, our world forwards. And there is a general cultural shift, I think, happening in Europe. I don't know if you see that too. Yeah, I, I see it happening. But in addition to that, I want to ask you a question because you have the experience from both Europe and the US. In the US, when you start a company and you fail, you're, you're being clapped at. People still think like, okay, you did a good job. You tried uh, you learn new stuff and you take that with you when you're starting your second company and in increasing your chances of success, raising money, etc. How does that differentiate uh, from your own experience with the European ecosystem, even 
it was at the time that you started your first company just after graduating yeah i i think um europe tends to be quite conservative and you obviously you need to look at europe as a whole but if you look at places like germany and, and places that are similar um financial conservatism is very important and, and failing and losing an investor's money is frowned upon in some countries there's personal liabilities there isn't a sophisticated financing ecosystem so the entrepreneurs in those countries have to take terms that are just not what we'd say is market there's always been this massive dispersion in terms of terms for financing for startups it's almost like you know if you're if you're in another country and you're in some parts of Europe, valuations are half to a third of what they are in in the U.S. And it's not a function of the fact that Europe's a small market size. That's nonsense. I think Europe is a massive market size. It's down to supply and demand, and it's down to the fact that there just aren't enough sophisticated investors. And if you you know what, actually they may be sophisticated. They may be so sophisticated, knowing that um, the startup founders themselves are not sophisticated, and so they can get away with terms that are. Uh, frankly, quite, you know, not market, as I say, in the US. Then again, the US might be, a, you know, polar opposite where everyone here is raising at crazy valuations and, and it's just expected to be that way. Um, f- so failure is a, is a, has always been something that's is great about the American culture. You know, it, it's a pride of honor um, and it's something you, you wear as a, 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 a war scar or a badge of honor, really. Um, and I, I, I like failure to a point, you know, I mean, if someone's constantly failing and they're, they're constantly trying to launch a company, constantly failing after a decade, something's wrong. Because I'm an extremist in this sense, but I believe if you, if you try to run a company for 10 years, you know, you will eventually hit it big, right? First three or four years are going to be tough. But after that, you know, you can eventually do it as long as you stay lean and you constantly pivot until you find the idea. Um, in other countries, you fail once, you fail twice, it's game over, your credibility is ruined, you lost investors' money, that's, that's outrageous. Here, I, I look at it more like, and I look at this personally as when an entrepreneur fails, um, they learn so much. We all learn so much more from our failures than we do from our successes. And successes create blind spots. When you're sitting on a big trend and everything's going great, you can be incompetent and you can still succeed. It's unfair, to be honest. I used to joke in, in my last company that I started, I used to say, you know, even a monkey could run this company. I used to say to investors and pitches, I used to say, look, you're wondering, like, you know, how the future's going to go. We, we, we went from 850K in year one to 15 million in year two to 56 million in year three. I said, look, to be completely honest, um, I'd have to be incompetent to screw this opportunity up. A monkey could run this company. We have made so many damn mistakes and we're still growing. So, you know, what do you learn when you're successful? Not that much. You know, you, you, you're spoiled brat, actually, because you, you like the taste of success and you want quick fixes and you want quick wins. Failure is what creates that discipline. You know, when, when, you, when you sweat and you bleed and you cry for your startup and you build it block by block and you get rejection after rejection and you finally get that first pilot and then you get your first $10,000 contract, and then you get your $30,000 contract, and then you get five more of those. That's when you build your business um, in the pure way, you know? And um, it takes failure to achieve success. And in this world, by the way, whether you're a venture capitalist or a startup founder, you only need to be right once. That's it, you only need to be right once. And if it takes 20 to 100 no's and failures to find that one, that hits big, it makes up for all the failures. So, you know, that's my view on failure. And I I can't really give a a comment on where Europe is right now, because I think I have to live there and have to be pitching to investors daily. But I think the European investors are are much more forgiving than they were um, a decade ago, which is when I was out there pitching European, you know, investors. Yeah, I I think I think we are in general quite in in a paradigm shift here, not only from a startup perspective, because um, well, uh, never waste a good crisis is uh, really a saying that I see uh, a lot on LinkedIn nowadays. And a lot of people in my network is saying, like, I started my own business. And um, it's it's really promising. It's encouraging. And it motivates me also to uh, be even more committed than I already was uh, to what I'm doing right now. And um, when we when we look at how a market evolves and how uh, change is occurring and why certain steps are taken, um, COVID is 
inevitably one of the biggest change makers over the, the last years. And uh, let me illustrate how it has affected a bit of the, 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 the real estate sector. I mean, when we were looking at the beginning of 2020, uh, everything was shutting down. Everybody was in crisis mode. Nobody knew like how to respond. They thought like, well, maybe this is a flu that will eventually go over or uh, uh, very soon, maybe. But it turned out that it, that it wasn't. And it was uh, for us in the beginning quite tough because a lot of uh, deals that were on the table, well, they were postponed to somewhere uh, until further notice. Well, and you, you can imagine how that works. Nobody knows what their cash flow is going to look like within the next month or maybe the next year. Like, how is a business going to operate? Really? Felix, so, well, not just that, right? The, the, many companies are now dealing with the fact that they have to furlough their employees or fire their employees. It's very hard to justify spending on a prop tech startup, which at that point is a nice to have when you've got must haves and you've got this crisis that you don't know how long it's going to last and you don't know whether it's a flu or whether it's a, you know, a pandemic, which is what it became.